In the late 1960s, after the civil rights movement, people like weatherman Bill Ayers and Herbert Marcuse's PhD student Angela Davis traded the peaceful protests of Martin Luther King Jr. for violent riots and domestic terrorism to force their identity politics on the American public. This didn't win over many sympathizers, so they shifted their gaze to education, just like Antonio Gramsci, and almost all of them eventually went to teach K-12. Neo-Marxism had divorced from vulgar Marxism and adopted identity as its new sensibility. And so, in conjunction with the Black Liberation and Black Feminism movements, the new Identity Marxism movement took shape. 1971 came, and the long march through the institutions finally paid off for cultural Marxism in the legal sphere, since many civil rights cases were being adjudicated upon. The first landmark case in identity politics, Griggs versus Duke Power, set a scary precedent. Duke Power had been giving intelligence tests to people in the lowest tier of employment to determine if they could advance in their careers, and they did so knowing that black Americans couldn't read as well as whites, since schools hadn't caught up yet after desegregation. Duke Power was rightfully sued, and the practice was deemed discrimination, but the ruling opened the door wide for all kinds of things to slip through. They ruled that disparate impact, meaning different outcomes, inequity, could be used as proof of discrimination, even without intent. This may have worked for Duke's case, but it aligned perfectly with identity Marxism's focus on power dynamics, since any difference in power could be ruled as discrimination in the future. The next year, a woman named Pat Vidal published Developing New Perspectives on Race, which changed the landscape entirely, again. Less than a decade prior, MLK's 1963 I Have a Dream speech advocated for judging everyone on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In 1972, Vidal refined racism as prejudice plus power, and so MLK's dream died on the doorstep of identity politics. No longer would racism be confined to prejudice based on skin color. It could now be broadened to mean whatever one wanted, because everything is a power dynamic, so everything can be racist. Yes, this idea is not new, it's been around for a long time. Vidal also coined a few phrases you may have heard in the last few years. You are either part of the problem or part of the solution. People are either racists or anti-racists. There is no neutral. Ibram X. Kendi has Vidal to thank for that one. In 1973, Vidal produced a manual in conjunction with the NEA, the Teachers' Union, which was then disseminated through the public school system. Don't be surprised if the Teachers' Union today supports critical race theory. They have for a long time. It's not about teaching your kids to learn to read and write, it's about power. Next up in 1974 was the forming of the Combahee River Collective, named after the 1863 raid of Combahee River, which was conducted by Harriet Tubman, and which emancipated 700 slaves. Unlike Tubman, the organization was styled as a black feminist lesbian socialist collective, and it put out the Combahee River Collective Statement in 1977. This was the height of black liberation and black feminism that had emerged out of neo-Marxism and the civil rights movement. This statement is credited with introducing the concept of interlocking systems of oppression within society, which is a key part of intersectionality. Another event happened in 1977 that isn't core to DEI but is still interesting. Angela Davis made a statement to her friend, cult leader Jim Jones. Contrary to popular belief, Jim Jones wasn't a crazy Christian, but a neo-Marxist. Angela compared the two movements and called them one and the same. I attempted to say, though not very eloquently, that we are with you, and we appreciate everything you have done, and we know you are going to win, and in the final analysis, we are all going to win. Back to Combahee River, the goal of introducing intersectionality was for one reason, to bring other movements of oppressed minorities under one banner to carry water for the black feminist movement, and it worked like a charm. In 1978, another landmark court case was ruled upon. Regents of the University of California v. Backey was a case of racial discrimination in the University of California. Affirmative action was ruled as being legal because it can sometimes be justified by a need for diversity. However, they ruled that having only a few minority students in a university wouldn't be enough to give them a comfortable experience, and the minority voice wouldn't be adequately represented since they would be some kind of token students. So a significant number of minority students would be required to alleviate the problem. Even though quotas were acknowledged as being illegal, race quotas got in through the back door that this case opened up. This adequate number of minority students was called a critical mass. 
Justice Lewis Powell laid out a set of principles to be used in university admissions. 1. Quotas are illegal and cannot be used. 2. Everyone should be reviewed under the same admissions track. 3. Race should be included as a plus factor in addition to things like life experience, talents, or geography. 4. Applicants should be treated as individuals, not stand-ins for any particular group. 5. No favoritism should be given to any race. But you can see, especially through Principle 3, how this system of principles can be exploited. And it was. The same year, the next big milestone came. Judith Katz wrote the book White Awareness and through it became the pioneer of white re-education. She believed the system of whiteness that was ingrained in America was racist, and in her own words, the program strives to help whites understand that racism in the United States is a white problem and that being white implies being racist. Read that sentence again. Being white implies being racist. Therefore, white people can't win. Racism is the combination of prejudice plus power, and whites are the default or master race in America. So no matter what happens, thanks to Adorno's authoritarian personality, whiteness is discrimination. Whiteness is racism. It was plain to see even in 1978. 1979 had yet more milestones on the critical race theory history track. John Francois Lyotard wrote The Postmodern Condition, in which he coined the term legitimation by horology. Fancy words aside, this is the concept of consensus making things true. If enough people agree on something, then that thing becomes true. You can see how, like Leotard said, this is very dangerous. He was actually warning against it in his book. Nowadays, this concept is combined with repressive tolerance. The right wing is suppressed, and the left wing is supported. Then, enough popular leftist voices agree on something, and that thing becomes true. Unfortunately, some members of the media, some members of the media, some members of the media, some, some members of the media use their, their platforms to push their own personal bias, bias. to push their own personal bias and agenda, to control exactly what people think. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This gives people immense power and is akin to the idea of might makes right. Another important court case came that year too. United Steelworkers vs. Weber took a big step down the road that Griggs vs. Duke Power and Regents vs. Backey had created. Women and minorities were given the ability to be favored in sex or race conscious hirings as a form of fulfilling the backdoor quotas. Remember, the running idea was that the system was inherently off balance, with the elite controlling the oppressed. And so, to right that imbalance, this ruling was handed down. Also, the statute of limitations on historical oppressions was lifted. Essentially, the Supreme Court agreed that historical oppression, like American slavery or women's rights suppression, was enough to allow someone special hiring privileges in return. If a limitation was given, the justice for that oppression may never come to pass. So historical oppression was allowed to refer to any historical oppression ever, and the oppressed status would never be lifted. That's why reparations will never work today, because the same people can just keep claiming victimhood with legal precedent.